Sal Berry. Take your picture with me. Like I'm the Easter Bunny or something. And Tim Parrish. Maybe Al the Octopus is Dylan Larkin. You Um, heard it here first if that turns out to be true. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Berry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today we're going to talk about some of the trades that went down recently in the NHL. We're also going to talk about the uh, cup set that just came out, the 2021 Upper Deck The Cup set, as well as the forthcoming Signature Legends set. And then we're also going to talk about the 22-23 Tops Hockey Sticker Album set. I was holding off on that because I wanted to like talk about that set when I had it completed, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. So, Tim, what's going on with you? Uh, I feel like I haven't had my energy drink today. Oh, no? What's your drink of choice? Is it uh, five-hour energy? Um, no, I generally just siphon the gas up my car and drink that. Mm, yeah, I got a Gatorade here. It's much tastier than uh, gasoline. They put all kinds of extra additives for flavor now. In Gatorade, you mean? No, in gasoline. Oh, okay. If you really do drink gasoline, that explains a lot. It explains the bad breath, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, yeah, I can smell it through Skype. Ooh. Smell-o-vision. Yes. So we had a bunch of trades go on since our last podcast, which last two podcasts, we kind of had like big trades to talk about. Now we've had like a lot of like, I'd say mid-sized trades, no blah, well, maybe kind of big trades, but not like Vladimir Tarasenko level trade. Since we recorded the last show, I mean, probably by far the biggest trade was the Coyotes getting Shea Weber. So I, I think that's the biggest news, wouldn't You're you kidding. say? I'm kidding that it's the biggest news, or I'm kidding that it actually happened. Both. It did actually happen. (laughs) Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. Weber didn't retire, so they literally they took on his contract. Yeah, because the Golden Knights had his contract, if you recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so now the Coyotes took that. So he joins the power line of players in Arizona, along with Chris Bronger and and all those. Mary and Hosa. That that. uh, Marion Hosa. have had their contracts absorbed, yeah. So, no, but seriously, that was like one of the first things that happened after we kind of talked the last time on the last show. But, I mean, the Hawks made some deals here and there, moving some small guys around. I know who was that, uh, Josiah Slavin. I didn't even know he was Hawks property, but he moved over to the Ducks, and uh, they got Nikita Zaitsev. I saw that from the Senators. But one of the bigger ones, I think, was the Bruins and Capitals trade, where the Bruins mm-hmm. picked up Dmitry Orloff and Garnet Hathaway. That was a three-team trade because they had to bring the Wild in to be banker. And that seems to be a trend because there's these teams that just don't have the money and can't make the cap space work, so they got to have players that come on and have their salaries deferred somehow elsewhere because they can't bring them on to their salary, you know, their salary cap space, because they don't have it. But that ended up being a three-way trade. So the Bruins get Orloff and Hathaway and also a forward prospect from the Wild, uh, Andre Svetlikov, I think his name was. And then the Capitals get Craig Smith, a first-round pick in 23, a third-round pick in 24, and a second-round pick in 25. And then the Wild, for their troubles, get a fifth-round pick from the Bruins. In 23. So that was kind of a an interesting mix of players that kind of funneled around with a third party kind of intermediary in between those. And uh, my kid, Daniel, texted me yesterday. No, it wasn't yesterday. It was Saturday about Nino Niederreiter going to the Jets. He can make a pretty big impact, I think. Because he can score goals. The Jets need some of that. That's a pretty good deal on their part to pick him up. Although I did say my response to him was he's also getting married to Nick Benino. And he's going to be Nino Benino. Nino Benino. That was my joke for him. But although I think Nick Niederreiter would also work. Yeah, maybe. He changed his name. The stars got Dadden off or Dadon off or whatever he's calling himself this week from the Canadians. 
So that was an interesting pick. I saw the Blackhawks also dump Jack Johnson back to the Avalanche. Yeah, I like how he fit in on Chicago. I thought he was like a good veteran presence. Obviously, if the team is going to try to rebuild and be a championship team, he's not going to be that veteran presence by the time the team is a contender. So it probably just made sense. Like, eh, you're a good player, but we really can't use you right now. Let's trade you back to the team that had your rights a year ago and that you helped win. I know Jack Johnson was a third overall pick. Maybe he wasn't worthy of being the third overall pick for whatever reason, but he... I think he was at the time. He was at the... Well, everybody is at the time. You know, everybody looks good before the... Hindsight's they, always twenty twenty, right? Right. But what I'm saying is, like, he's a good NHL defenseman. He's a solid NHL defenseman. I mean, he any team he goes on, he makes that team better. You look at how good... No, good is an understatement. Great is an understatement. How awesome the defense core in Colorado was last year. And he was a part of that. He was what, like maybe fifth on the depth chart? Yeah, he's a bottom pairing. Yeah, but I mean, here he was not a bottom pairing in Chicago, but in Colorado. But that's okay because, you know, when you have Kale McCarr and um, Josh Manson and uh, Bowen Byram. Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson. Yeah, they had two Johnsons. He's been hurt. Yeah. So, yeah, and then the Hawks made uh, another trade. You want to talk about that one? They're just dumping off their defensemen. Like any halfway decent defenseman who's not Seth Jones because we can't trade him, but every other halfway decent defenseman must go. No reasonable offers rejected. The latest one was Jake McCabe and Sam Lafferty. Both go to the Leafs. I think they got a pick out of that, too. It was like a fifth rounder. And a fifth rounder in 24 and a fifth rounder in 25. In return, the Blackhawks get uh, Joey Anderson. And is it Gugulev or Gogolev? I think it might be Gogolev. But they also get a first round pick in 25 and a second in 26. So pretty good picks to pull out of that deal for a couple of players. I like Sam Lafferty. I always did. I liked him when he was on the Penguins. I don't really know much about Jake McCabe. I imagine he's a fairly solid defenseman, but otherwise, why would Toronto take him? Because that's where they need help. Believe it or not, McCabe was actually, if I remember correctly, like a plus seven this year, which is ridiculous considering that Seth Jones is minus 22. Yeah. And they're D partners. And he was actually doing decent for being on a terrible team. So the fact that the Blackhawks were able to get a first round pick from the Leafs as a part of this deal is pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, anytime you can stock, you stock the future full of picks, especially high round picks, that's always a good thing. It's like this in most leagues too. Once you get out of the first round, it starts to spread pretty thin. In the NHL, a lot of times, once you get out of the top 10, it starts to spread thin. So, you know, you look at some of these up and coming crops of prospects that that are going into the drafts and the various draft years that they're going to hit you got to have a plan and i think the hawks i think we've said it before sometimes you got to burn it down to build it back up and that's kind of what they're doing i think some of the other notable ones that, that have gone on other than that one boston one you saw the canucks picked up vitaly crafts off right from the rangers mm-hmm. in exchange for william lockwood which every time I hear that name, I, just, I think of Flint Lockwood from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Yes, that's that. exactly what most people would think of. And all I think of in my head is hearing Mr. T's voice saying, Flint Lockwood. That's how he would say it. But yeah, Crafts Off, famously the rookie that had the Panini exclusive when Panini didn't have hockey license and had all those wonderful cards with Panini. For his rookie season in the various score and prism and select products that you could only buy through on demand. But I digress. What about that devil's trade? You had Mike Rupp every single day saying, I'm going to keep saying this, that the devils need Timo Meyer until they pick up Timo Meyer. And it was just every day for the last few weeks. They need to get Timo Meyer. They need to get Timo. Well, guess what? Now they got him. So they got Timo Meyer, they got Timor. I don't even know who this guy is. It's like Ibragimov or something like that. I never even heard of that guy. Uh, they got Scott Harrington and they got Santeri Hataka and Zach Emmond, 
who's a goalie, and a fifth-round pick in 24. So that's a lot, a lot of pieces. They sent to the uh, Sharks, Fabian Zetterland and Andreas Johansson, Shakir Makamadoulin, I believe is how it's pronounced. Man, you're just crushing it tonight. Yeah, and Nikita <laughs> Akodia. Yeah, see, when I don't have my energy drink, I can actually speak English, even though none of these names are English. And then they also get a first-round pick in 23 and a conditional second-round pick in 24 and a seventh in 24. So that was a lot of parts. I think there's nine different parts to that trade. That's a lot. I mean, granted, that's nowhere near like some kind of blockbuster deal like the Doug Gilmore trade was, you know, 10 players for one kind of thing. It's not anything like that. But you don't see a lot of trades anymore in the NHL with a lot of movement like that and a lot of parts. So I thought that was kind of exciting to see all of those different dimensions to that trade. But Timo Meyer to the Devils. I mean, the East just keeps getting stronger. The Eastern Conference teams, they're all stacked. It's getting crazy over there. And and again, you know, like I said, the East keeps getting stronger. The Lightning got Tanner Janot from the Predators. And they gave up. A hell of a lot. Got, I think they got Cal Foot. They got a first-round pick in 25. They got a second-round pick in 24. And a third, fourth, and fifth-round pick in 23. So it is a lot. Tanner Janot is a really good player. I mean, there aren't many hard-hitting, very physical type players like him that can, oh, by the way, also put the puck in the net. So having that extra grit is definitely something that Tampa Bay can use. Yeah, so I mean, there's been plenty of others. I'm skipping like a whole bunch of them because they're not really sexy and exciting because everybody's sitting here with bated breath on eggshells waiting for the drop of the hammer for Patty Kane. So by the time we have a show to record next week, we'll be able to talk about that, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, with the trade deadline happening Friday, so we'll have more to to talk about. But hey, let's talk about that goalie goal. I didn't get a chance to see that. I was actually at a game, at a different game, when that happened. I'll talk about that later, but I heard about it. And then I saw the highlights earlier, or the highlights, the, the clip of it earlier today, and it was a damn good goal. Yeah, there's a couple things here. Well, first, One, let's say who it was. Well, yeah. Linus Allmark scored for the Bruins against Vancouver Canucks. This was last Saturday. So, number one, you know, there's multi dimensions to this. A, it's a goalie goal, which we don't see very often. B, it's a goalie goal from arguably the best goalie in the NHL this year on the best team. And, you know, here's a player that almost put it in the net during the Winter Classic against the Penguins. You know, late in the game where he just barely missed by a few inches from putting it in the empty net. But Canucks pulled the goaltender in this one with only like 48 seconds left. And uh, he knocked the puck right out of midair and sauced it up all the way down the ice. And it landed right by the uh, hash mark and just slid right in the net. It was it was a beautiful goal. It was centered. It was well centered. Yeah. It was definitely a beautiful goal. Makes you wonder if he had the event at the uh, All Star Skills Competition was some practice that he got in, able to sauce that like that. Well, if anything, maybe it whetted his appetite a little bit. I mean, every goalie wants to do that, but some are more bold than others. And I mean, anytime you're a goalie and you take a shot on net, that's bold. But I mean, he just lofted it. And I mean, and there were four checkers. And he was in front of the net. A lot of times they're behind the net. He was in front of the goal line when he played the puck. And it just sailed beautifully. I mean, it was... <laughs> I mean, he's now the eighth goalie to shoot and score a goal. We'll call that Hextall style, not to be confused with Smith style. So... Billy Smith is the first goalie to be credited with a goal, but he was the last to touch it. And then the puck went into the opponent's net for one reason or another. In the case of Billy Smith, it was the Colorado Rockies before they became the New Jersey Devils. The Colorado Rockies defenseman, Rob Ramage, mishandled the puck and it went back 180-ish feet back into his own net. Billy Smith was the last Islander to touch the puck and was credited with the goal. So that's the Smith style, where 
it, you're the last person to touch it, and you just happen to be that team's goalie. And uh oh, now the puck went into the other team's net because they bobbled it or something, and you get credited for it. Okay, but then the Hextall styles when you actually fire it down and you hit that net, and that is the more badass version of a goalie goal. Of which he did twice. Hextall, yes, he did. Yeah, he scored twice, and Martin Brodeur scored three times. And a whole host of other players. Who again was the last one before this one? I don't know. Some guy in the Predators. I, I don't remember his name. Uh, I don't know if he was any good either. Pikachu was his name? P- 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 Pika, yeah. Pikachu. Pika Rhine, something like that. Against the Blackhawks. Pekka Rene. <laughs> and that was, what, two years ago? January was, 2020, I think. Yeah, so about three years ago. Yeah. Because it was, it was before the world fell apart. I know that. That was a terrible game for the Blackhawks. And then that empty net goal by Pecorine was just like the exclamation point on like the team and its season pretty much. And then, I mean, you know, then they played another month and a half and then, and then, yeah. And then the world shut down Pikachu. When I played Pokemon Go, I'd rename my Pokemon because you could change their names. Some names they wouldn't let you use. If it was vulgar, they wouldn't let you use it. There was one Pokemon with giant hands, and I wanted to call it Bitch Slap. It wouldn't let me call it Bitch Slap. So I I called it Beach Slap, because that was close enough. I thought that'd be a great name for a Pokemon with giant hands. But I had a couple of Pikachus that I was, like, training and leveling up and stuff like that. So one was Pekachu. One was Pikachichu. Pikachichu. That's a good one. And then I had Pikachu Band. That's also a good one. That's yes. solid. There was one Pokemon, I think when you evolved the Pidgey, it evolved into a Starling. So then I called him Scott Starling. That's good. Yeah, I, I had I had a bunch of them, but I haven't played that game in like, probably since the pandemic. So here we are. So I, I don't know, maybe they're all deleted now or wherever. Pokemon Go when you don't play your Pokemon Go game. I was going to say, my stepson just showed me something on that game today at dinner. He was like, look at this gym. And it had like one of every EV evolution in the same gym. I'm like, oh, that cool. was that was highly coordinated. But yeah, I think fantasy hockey has probably taken a little more of my free time. Although you play Pokemon Go on the go and you play fantasy hockey usually at your desk because you're looking up stats and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, Pekka Rene got that goal against the Blackhawks and that was about three years ago. So now goalie goals are happening a little more frequently, which is nice because they're fun. Anyway, uh, you want to talk about Barry Trotz? I don't want to talk about him, but we kind of have to because now he's back in the news. Not taking a coaching job this time. He's the new GM of the Nashville Predators because David Poyle announced his retirement. So the heir apparent will be longtime Predators coach Barry Trotz. David Poyle retires. And Poyle has been their only GM in team history, right? It's the only one they've had since 97. Wow. So that's some job security right there. I mean, seeing as how slow the team is to change GMs, yeah, I would say this sounds like a pretty good job to retire to if you're Barry Trotz and you do a good enough job to keep it. When they were awarded the franchise, he was assigned to GM. His first hire for head coach was Barry Trotz. So, you know, they have a long history together. And then leading up to that, I mean, essentially, Barry Trotz was like a scout until their first game, you know, scouting other teams, other players, looking at how they can improve, fix the roster and improve the roster and make it better once they had the draft and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, by the time they played their first game, they they had hit the ground running. But like I said, there's a lot of history there. And I think if you were going to take anybody in the league currently that's in some type of position or was in some type of position that's a logical choice especially considering there's been tons of offers given to barry trotz to come back behind the bench in various organizations and he's kind of turned them all down and i think that's what he was waiting for he kind of knew that his next step was to move into some type of upper management position you know he's he's been involved in coaching a long time he's like 914 670 and 168 He even has 60 ties back when they still had ties. He spent 15 seasons as the coach of the Predators and four each with the Capitals and the Islanders. Lou fired him. It was in May of 2022. 
he was fired by the Islanders. Of course, he's got the cup with the Capitals. He ranks third amongst NHL coaches and wins. Oh. So now he gets to take over for the winningest GM in the NHL. So it'll be interesting. I don't want to say he's getting a gift to start off, but you know, with some of those trades we were talking about earlier, a bunch of them involved the Predators. You know, they they got rid of Niederreiter and Tanner Janot. But in both of those trades, between everything, they picked up six picks over the next three drafts. So that includes current year draft, which, oh, guess what? It's being held in Nashville. So the stage is kind of set for him to be able to put his imprint on this team right off the bat. And I'm sure David Poyle will still be around to advise. I wouldn't imagine he's just going to walk away completely, but at least he won't be in charge. Yeah, most of these hockey guys don't walk away completely unless they're kind of forced out, like a Mike Babcock type situation. Or a Mark or, Crawford. Did you see the thing with Mark Crawford? Because he's over coaching in like Switzerland or, or Sweden or something. Refresh like that. my memory. I was out of town he, for a couple of days. So I was yeah. not like totally caught up with what was going on, but I was trying to stay caught up. Yeah, he made some other comments about things got himself in trouble again with his mouth well it was against the referee is basically what it was it wasn't racist this time it was what's the word oh it was homophobic you guys can go look up what he said but it has something to do with a uh, a male chicken vacuum let's call it that way <laughs> which i've heard plenty of people use that phrase and, and call people those things for many 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 years Right, so, right, right, right. you know, it is what it is. It rhymes with sock plucker. Yes, it does. It absolutely does. Which sock plucker would actually just be funny to say. Like, you, you sock plucker. What? Because then they would just stop what they were doing and be like, what? What are you, what are you crazy, man? You know what I mean? Like, it would, it would totally throw them off. Instead kill of them like, with confusion. Kill them with confusion. I like that. Instead of killing them with kindness or fighting fire with fire, you kill them with confusion, right? You just... Yeah, confused the hell out of them. So I don't know. I'm not inside of Mark Crawford's head. I know that he said he was doing therapy when it came out that he was the shithead like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when he was like the coach of the Canucks. He just um, has anger problems. That's all. Find me an NHL coach that doesn't. That's exactly what I was going to say. Shoot. Even Mike Sullivan, who seems like a pretty calm guy, gets pissy. And of course, oh, yeah. we know Bruce Boudreaux from those 24 7 documentaries where he's like, Doing the pregame locker room speech where he's cursing every other word. Yeah, or the the famous meme of him, where clearly he's saying the f word on the bench, and like people always put a different word underneath. Yes, like poop. <laughs> 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 and it's like uh, clearly that's not what he's saying, but it's funny. Yeah. So anyway, I went to two Carolina Hurricanes games this past weekend, thanks to our buddy Jim Howard, who is a Carolina Hurricanes season ticket holder. Sometimes he's a co-host on this podcast. Sometimes he's a contributor to Puck Junk. He's also it was... the master of our theme song. Oh, yes, yes. He wrote the theme song and performed the theme song. I'll tell you, I have never been to a hockey game outside of Chicago. I went to, on Friday, February 24th, I saw them play Ottawa, which was awesome because they shot them out four to nothing. And then on Saturday, February 25th, I saw the Hurricanes play the Anaheim Ducks, and they lost to the Ducks like three to two. The point is, is that I'd never gone to other arenas before, and I did for the first time, and it was a lot of fun. And now I kind of want to do this sort of thing. Maybe I'll try to make a day trip and go to like a Vegas game or something, you know, because there's lots of flights to Vegas, and I wouldn't even need to get a hotel. I could just fly there and fly back, maybe. You could. It's a long day, but you could. Let, let me ask you a question on that. Sure. Let me play the interviewer. So you've been to like a bajillion Hawks games and stuff. Now that you've got to go experience a game in another market with another team, albeit kind of an expansion team, and I'm using air quotes for that. Right. Because obviously we know they were the Whalers at one point. Versus, uh, air quotes again, original six team. Mm-hmm. How would you say the presentation of the game differs from one location to the other? 
so I've only gone to a handful of Blackhawks games in like the past five or so years because the tickets were expensive and they were maybe not hard to get, but they were just cost prohibitive. I feel like all fans that are at the game, most of them have fun because they're there because they want to be there, right? You get your corporate types who are there because it looks cool or somebody gave them tickets or whatever. I was up in the 300s and like everybody up there was like super passionate and like having fun and starting chants and shouts and one section over was trying to do the wave and then people in my section were like, no, no, too early, too early. Don't feel like it. You, you know what I mean? But like, I almost feel like, with no disrespect to Blackhawks fans, I felt like the Carolina Hurricane fans were more fun in the sense that they're willing to let themselves go a little more and have that fun, if that makes sense. Like, this is a hockey game, it's supposed to be fun, versus this is a hockey game, it's supposed to be serious. I feel like when I go to Blackhawks games, people are a little more serious, and when I go to Chicago Wolves games, it's a little more fun. Like the people are a little more fun and the team tries harder to make it fun. Like that whole, like, let's make some noise. And then they show like that fake meter that like shows how loud the crowd is and stuff like that. They do that yeah. all the time. At the Wolves the games. Fun gauge bin. Yeah. Well, they do those <laughs> at the Wolves game, but the Wolves will have like a crowd of like 7,000. So whatever, 8,000. But then at the HL game, games are fun though. Yeah. But now imagine that at a crowd of like 18,000, it gets loud. So the Hurricanes games, the crowd is loud. The crowd is having fun. Yes, at the Blackhawks game, the crowd is loud. I mean, they cheer during the anthem so loud your ears will ring sometimes. Nobody yeah. cheers during the anthem at the Canes game. Although they'll all say red real loud when they say rockets, red glare, you know, because they wear red. But every team does that sort of thing. It feels like if it, whether it's stars for – actually, I was doing that where they were like – uh who's broad stripes and bright. And then I went stars. Well, nobody else did because it was a hurricanes game. So nobody's going to yell that. And then I also yelled out night when they said, uh, came through, through the, and I was like, night. And then I looked at Jim. I said, oh, wait, sorry, wrong rink. It was fun. And you know, the other thing, their gift shop had a lot of fun t-shirts. Their Russian goalie, whose name I can't pronounce, and he's on the Chicago Wolves, so I should be able to pronounce it. But they made a t-shirt like with a goalie silhouette on it and it says yet minder because he's Russian. And I'm like, okay, I need to have that shirt. I'll figure out how to pronounce his name later, but I need me a yet minder shirt because that's just too cool. Unfortunately, they didn't have any more bunch of jerk stuff except for a hoodie, which I wasn't going to buy because I already have a t-shirt, but I wanted another t-shirt and um, they didn't have any more of those. But and you know, the other thing too, like if you missed a bobblehead giveaway, they have them for sale in the team store, which I thought was pretty cool. They're 50 bucks, which is a lot for a bobblehead, but that's pretty cool. Oh, and yeah. I picked up a stadium series program for four bucks plus tax. That's not bad. Yeah. Well, the season ticket holders, they give them 10% off. So every time I wanted to buy something, Jim was like, no, no, let me, let me, let them scan my phone and then you can have my discount. So uh, it was like 10 or 20, uh, let me think. No, it was like 20% off. Because it was a five dollar program, but then I got it for four plus tax. So it was, uh, you know, it was a nice program. If you didn't get a chance to go to the stadium series, but you want the program really bad, you know, it was a way to pick one up. So yeah, it was cool. I don't know if I really want to try to make it to all thirty two teams. You have these people who like they want to make it to every rank. I don't know. I I can't really see myself wanting to go to Winnipeg in the middle of winter. Maybe a Florida Panthers game in the middle of winter would be fun, but I kind of got the bug, so I'm going to maybe look into that, maybe going to a game somewhere next year. It's a lot of ground to travel to get to all teams. Yeah, and I know there are like people who try to do like, they're going to do all 32 teams in 32 days or 60 days or three months or whatever. Yeah, I'm not trying to one-up anything or anyone. I think I just want to experience new things and that was a new experience for me so i want to continue to add to that because it's just it's cool to go to other rinks oh and I'll, I'll say this too a lot of whalers jerseys there some of them were the reverse retro that were gray which i think are kind of ugly honestly the gray whaler jerseys you know what i'm talking about yeah but i saw a lot of green jerseys with aho or svechnikov and then i even saw somebody wearing a ron francis jersey which is cool, obviously. So, yeah, 
they kind of really embrace the whole whaler thing now. According to what Jim told me, when Carmanos was still the majority owner, they really didn't talk about the whalers. But then when Tom Dundon bought into the team and then became the majority owner, he really was the one who was pushing for like the whalers night, you know, where they wear their whaler jerseys against the Bruins and reverse retro logos and stuff like that. So they really like that. Did you stay for the celebration after their win? So, yeah, okay, so they lost on Saturday, so there was no storm surge in the second game. The first game, they won, and they did storm surge. I was a little disappointed, because all they did was, like, they stood in the circle, they did the thing where they clapped their hands over their heads, and then, you know, boom, 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 and then they all, like, swarmed to, like, you know where the little referee circle right outside of the penalty boxes? They, like, all swarmed to that, like, little half circle and, like, hugged. And that was it. No human bowling, no dominoes, no skating from goal line to goal line. None of that. So I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. Oh, and that's all they're doing. Okay. Well, they did something. I could say I saw Storm Surge. There you go. All right. Let's talk cards. I know you've been obsessing over watching other people's box breaks. Well, like, that's me obsess over something. A l- little bit of card voyeurism here, but you know what? I mean, that's kind of what collecting is. I mean, that's why people post box breaks, myself included, or um, they live stream breaks, you know, especially if they're selling the cards in the break, you know, or even just posting videos on YouTube of like, Hey everyone, this is Sal, and I'm going to show you what I got in a box of 2021 SP Authentic. All right, we're going to open up the first pack now, and then that's when I start hitting the fast forward button. But yeah, the cup, and you got thoughts about 2021, the cup. I mean, honestly, who doesn't have thoughts at this point? Um, People are listening for your thoughts. I don't think so. Nobody really wants to know what I have to say. But with that being said, I'm going to say it anyway. So this was purely for research. I wouldn't branch out on my own and spend the time and effort reviewing these things if I didn't love all of our fans and care to pass on this information to everyone. And that's why I did this, purely for research. Let's just get that out of the way right off the bat. So I happened upon really early on, on release day, a YouTube video of a break. So I thought, eh, I'll check it out. I kind of posted my ongoing saga as I would watch each one. I had a a thread going of my observations on on Twitter, which you can go back on my timeline and find it if you're looking to find all of that. But just to recap, the first break I watched, it was a complete and utter disaster of a break when it comes to trying to salvage some type of value out of a product that's released it. $1,249 $1,249 for a tin. Ugh. Yeah. And uh, a couple things I, I noticed, you know, this was obviously a high end product. It's the cup. It's a beautiful product, beautiful cards, great looking card. They're slick, well designed for the most part. I, I mean, they look great. They look like a high end card. I will give them that. But initially, lots of non-hockey people posted videos, breaking cards. I know it shouldn't bother me, but it does. It's a pet peeve of mine. That's why I try to make sure I pronounce players' names right. I don't always get them right, but I at least make an attempt. There's so many people breaking product for hockey that don't even bother trying. If you don't watch the sport, you're not a fan of the sport, and you're breaking product because you heard it was something cool, I don't know what to tell you because you're not going to know what's in there. You're not going to know what you're going to get. And if you're not excited about something and you don't care to learn about it, then you get what you get. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. So that was the first one that I watched. So I was already kind of disappointed when it came to that because of all the mispronunciations of names, but you know, it's going to happen. Then I saw another one and, you know, started seeing some of the different inserts and subsets within the cup set that were coming out, the retired legend and hall of fame cards that were in there. I did notice there were a lot. I didn't realize there were that many 
retired player subjects in the cup. I thought it was mostly newer. I did. I, I guess I just didn't realize that they stuck that many subjects that were uh, would be in the retired or legend category. Kind of bugged me a little bit that I've seen a ton of pulls of. I don't even know that you can call it retro product. It's like update. I mean, I saw 2017 update and 2019 update cards being mm. pulled fairly frequently. Apparently, there's stuff from 2014 out there, too, that I heard. That kind of astounds me, because not only are we basically two years late from a product that should have been out already, but now there's update cards from even longer ago that count as hits. But... Um, but the second one I watched, the tin wasn't as big of a bust as that first one, but it kind of led to the same thing that it was starting to seem like you were probably 50 to 60 percent of purchase value to card value. I mean, the cards do look awesome, so I'll give you that. Now, wait, when you say 50 percent of the purchase value. Yeah. So if, you're, guess... buying, if you're buying in on a tin at 1250. You're not getting twelve fifty eight back. How many cards did you get? Like five or six? Five. Five. I'm pretty sure it's five. Maybe it's six. Mm. I think it's five. And the the collation's the same, or I shouldn't say the collation. The order is the same. Yeah. Okay. What so is your it? top card is going to be your common. Okay. Your bottom card is going to be your common rookie. Okay. The second card in the stack seems to be the RPA, and then the other two underneath that are something else, whatever else is in there. So. That seemed to be how they were falling. You know, another video that I watched, guy pulled the first limited logo that I saw at that point. Those patches were ridiculous. They're super nice. I thought those were really cool. I'm going to definitely try to find a couple for certain players on the uh, third-party circuit once those get floated around out there. I heard a number of guys on videos talking about how Lafreniere was a complete and total bust. And this would have been a great card two years ago, but it sucks now and whatever. And yeah, I don't even know what to say to that stuff. Sure, he's not the hype machine that he was coming out of the box. We've discussed that on the show numerous times, but he's by no means a bust. And again, it's more non-hockey people busting hockey product. But anyway, I watched half a case break at one point. Cards didn't cover even half the cost of the case. I'll tell you that. Maybe not even one box. But now, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at is, what are you basing that on? Like that, like the common base card only sells for like five bucks. You're not going to get anything for the the common base card. If you sell it, you're right. It's going to go for five bucks. Okay. Maybe the common rookie, depending on who it is, might get you ten, twenty bucks. Because everybody's looking for the RPAs and the fancier stuff, right? So you look at your RPA. Unless you hit one of the big guys, that RPA ain't going to go for that much. And by not for that much, I mean, if you only get 200 bucks for the RPA, which for a rookie card, ungraded, kind of seems like a lot. But again, it's the cup. If you only got 200 bucks for it, how are you going to make up the other $1,000 out of... Two hundred and twenty-five dollars worth of cards. I guess so you have two cards left in a box that you have mm -hmm. to make up five hundred bucks a piece. Unless you nail a Wayne Gretzky auto or a Connor McDavid auto or something of that nature, good luck. You're not getting anywhere near that. So what you're saying is that it's very hard to get five cards that you can resell for a total value of. $1,200. If you're in it to try to break even or, or make some money off of it, unless you're going to hit the on top of spaghetti all covered with cheese, unless you're hitting the top of the mountain, you're not. You want to spend the 1200 bucks to bust open a crazy product? By all means, do so. It's fun. I mean, this is coming from somebody that's opened the cup before. It is fun. It gets the adrenaline flowing. It's a major rush to do it. But do not expect $1,200 worth of cards in every tin because you will not get it. Now, with that being said, I've seen a ton, a ton 
of Gretzky autos pulled. A ton. And yeah, I said I was going to stop watching these videos, but I did watch a few more after the fact. I've seen a bunch, and I've seen a bunch posted on social media as well, and I don't think many of them were duplicate posts from the videos I had already watched. So there's that. But like I said, I did watch that half case. Up to that point, I saw no sticker autographs that people were worried about. I saw a fight strap card come out of a box of a tin that had to be an inch thick. The card was super thick. It's huge. And again, the cards are great. Then I saw a full case break. Saw a lot of cool stuff in there. Somebody pulled a one-of-one one cut signature of Clarence Campbell and scrambled around for 15 minutes trying to figure out which team Clarence Campbell played for because they couldn't figure it out. I almost lost my mind, and if I could have reached into my screen and strangled somebody, I would have. When that happened, I had to ask somebody else in their company to go find out who Clarence Campbell was and which team he should put him under for his box break. This was an autograph? Oh, yeah, one of one cut signature. Wow. Just to explain for those who might not know, Clarence Campbell was the longtime president of the NHL. He wasn't the first president of the NHL, but he was the president for a long time, up until like 1974. So... Yeah, I mean, he's in the Hockey Hall of Fame as a builder. And prior to that, do you remember what he did? He was a referee. Oh, yeah, they were all something. They were all referees or rovers or something in the Pacific Coast League. The guy's a builder. He's been in the Hockey Hall of Fame since 1966. Mm -hmm. He helped the team through expansion. Like you said, he was the third president of the NHL. A lot of history. that he, He had a cup. Or he had a a trophy named after him. There was a conference in the NHL named after him. And here's people pulling cards going, who the heck is this guy? And that's sad. Because if it was you or me, we'd probably be over the moon that we got that Uh, card. I would have washed every pair of pants I owned. Because that would have been ridiculous to pull something like that. But yeah, that was just an observation. I mean, no clue who this guy was. What team am I going to put him on? Another guy finds out. Uh, he was like the president of the league. Oh, well, I guess we're going to raffle that one off. Yeah, okay, dude. Anyway, whatever. That's fine. That's not for me. I was looking at this stuff not as somebody buying into these things, but just to see what the cards were. Right, That's really yeah. it. That's yeah. all I was doing. That's okay. But, so if you want to have zero clue what it is you're doing and who these people are, whatever. That's fine. I will say this, that case they opened, there were a ton of cards from Tampa Bay, L.A., and Detroit. It's like all that was in there. Every hit from like was from one of those three teams. It was crazy. Then I got to see another like half case. The printing booklets look great. They're not all booklets, but the ones that are, awesome. What a concept. I don't know why they didn't do this from the beginning. You know? Printing plates, yeah, they're a one of one. A lot of people don't like them. A lot of people don't count them as a one of one. A lot of people think they're stupid. But if you're a player collector, they're sort of like, and I'm not saying this is a rule, but if you PC a guy, it's kind of cool to try to get all of his printing plates. Almost impossible to track them all down unless you already have found them. But this is one way you can get them all because they put them in a booklet and you flip open the booklet and there's all four of them. I own one printing plate booklet. I don't. I own a ton of printing plates, but I don't own no booklets. Yeah. You care to guess? It's probably pretty easy. I'm going to guess it's your goalie buddy. Yeah. Carter Um, Hutton, for those who don't know who Tim was talking about, who uh, retired after this past season due to injury. But yeah, I mean, it was funny because that was from the 1920 the cup and i think i paid like 40 bucks for it i was excited to get it for that low of a price because those four printing plates together like you said you sometimes you get one or two but to get all four of them and so to get all four of them at once and they're in like this book and it unfolds it looks cool yeah it's a one and done yeah you don't have to chase forever i think that's a good thing but again price by price, I mean what you paid for it, which is value. Big discrepancy in all of these. It took 
multiple cases, multiple half cases, and multiple boxes worth of videos for me to finally run into the biggest issue that has been labeled onto this product and the biggest gripe on social media. And that's, lo and behold, we had sticker autos. And we have a $1,200 product with sticker autos. Other than going all the way back to a few guys throughout the run of the cup since its inception, there's almost not been any. I said there's been a few exceptions. A few guys back in the beginning in the early days had sticker autos, but that's it. I haven't really had much by way of that. But it seems that the issue with getting certain players, namely Russians, Kuro Kaprizov and Ilya Sorokin. Uh, those are two of the main ones. And, of course, Kaprizov, the biggest one, because, again, in 2020, when they came out with the set, did they think Kaprizov was going to be as big as he was? Probably not. But we have the benefit of hindsight because we can fast forward a couple seasons and see that he's the pick of the litter out of the group. So that's the card that everybody wants. That's the card that everybody anticipated. And it comes out of the highly anticipated product slapped with sticker autos, including some where the dual autos in the card would be designed soft in the corners with two players. And instead of putting the sticker auto across, it doesn't fit because the player's on half the card and they actually cut the sticker autos to fit. So the player signed and maybe only the middle part of the sticker, they cut the ends off and stuck it on there. So it's like a square, little square piece, like a Band-Aid pad Mm -hmm. of that size. And they had to do that to fit it on the card. I Look, I get it. Did we want to wait another year, two years for this product to hit the market, waiting for him to actually sign on card? I don't think so. People would have rioted. But now they're also rioting because now they got sticker on us. But I get it. He didn't sign. They had problems with him signing. So they get a bunch of sheets of stickers. We slap it on the product. We get the product out there. That's fine. There have been a couple quality control issues I've seen. Most of them were on some of the update cards. Then, of course, there were a couple RPAs that people have posted missing the patch. That's been a couple things that that I've noticed. Overall, the the product looks great. It looks great. But (sighs) let me interject something. If the Kirill Kaprizov autographs are on a sticker, and that's pretty much how all his autographed cards are going to look, meaning they're going to be signed on a clear sticker that is then applied to the trading card, well, that's not going to devalue the value of his autograph. Because if people want an autograph, of Kaprizov on a rookie card or an RPA. It's going to be a That's sticker your only auto. option. Right. That's your only option. So there's but, no better option. So even but though it was platinum, he signed on card. Did he? Yes. Huh. But it's platinum. Which is fair. Oh, this is going to be fun to see what people do. So now here's, a, here's an argument. And you all the back cup. bending. Yeah. You, you got a platinum on card. You got a cup. You know, inferior product to the cup. The cup autos on sticker, does that make the Kirill on card in platinum? Does that boost its value all of a sudden now because it's an on card auto versus the other one that's not? I don't know that it does, but I think it definitely does diminish the value of the cup. Or it makes them a little more equal to one another. Maybe, maybe but a little more equal. Here's my that, problem though. Yeah. Upper Deck knew this. Upper Deck knew this. The question was asked. Because there's been a ton of redemptions that have been floating around for Kaprizov and other products for a very, very long time. And they're still floating around out there because he hasn't signed. So Upper Deck knew this. They knew the product was going to have to go out with sticker autos. They said nothing. Nothing was advertised. Nothing was put out there in the public. They didn't do anything about it to inform anyone. So knowing you're going in buying the cup and knowing it's three times what it was 10 years ago, price-wise, and the best card in it, the best player, is the one with the sticker. Why is it still 1250 bucks? 
I would think immediately that that price point should come way down. Yeah, well, one, now that the Clarence Campbell one of one cut signature card has been pulled and that's off the table, wink, wink. Yeah, that's off the table. But you know what else is off the table? Hmm. In the first three days of this being out there, the Kaprizov NHL shield, the one of one was pulled Hmm. and the Connor McDavid, both. So both one of one shield cards, the two biggest players that anybody would want to pull out of the sets, the two one of ones out of any of the cards, both of them are gone. So the two biggest cards are gone. It's sticker autos. There's a bunch of quality control issues that people have been seeing and, and posting. Every other box has your big hit is Sasha Chmielewski cards, who, as we all already know, went over to play in Europe and doesn't even play in the NHL. So it's like 1200 bucks. I mean, <sighs> under no moon that orbits the earth, am I ever going to justify that? I just can't. I, I really can't. No. Knowing those things. And yet there are people who are buying boxes and cases oh, hoping to get those big it's hits. Madness. It's madness. I mean, yeah, when stuff is new and comes out, people open it by the case, by the case, by the case, by the case. But that's, you know, $100 boxes or $150 boxes by the case or $200 boxes by the case or $400 boxes by the case. That's not 1200 by the case. You know, a six box case at 1200 bucks a box. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And even if you end up pulling a case hit or even let's say two case hits, what's that going to recoup you? 2 grand out of a case that cost you 9? Look, I like the cup. I've always liked the cup. The design is great. The player selection is good. There's great cards in it. Do what you want. Here's my word of advice. Do not buy these cards until you can find the one you're looking for and buy the singles. Because you will inevitably find the singles for way less. You get the card that you want specifically, and you're not going to have to pay $1,200. Unless, of course, it's a $1,200 card. But super gamble. You know, all those of you out there that, that love to gamble and are getting your part legs done and you, you do your stuff on your phone, this is perfect product for you because it is the ultimate gamble. I think it's interesting. This is the highest end hockey set that's come out since the pandemic. I mean, we had 1920 The Cup come out, and this is 2021 The Cup. So, we've, you know, this is two years ago, but you have a lot of, like you said, a lot of these people who don't know hockey, and they're not going to mess around with the low-end stuff. They might mess around with the Upper Deck Series 1, Series 2, as we've seen with the inflated cost of those boxes. They'll mess around with the metal set, as we've seen with the inflated cost of those boxes, And then they're all going to jump in with both feet on the cup because they don't know hockey, but they know that this is the most valuable hockey set. So that's the one that they're going all in on. Hence the extremely high prices, you know, supply and demand. And then the people opening boxes who don't know who half the people are. And if, you know, you're doing a box break, okay, that's fine. You maybe don't know this guy who played one game two years ago, never to be seen again, but he's got a rookie card. But at least like some of the regular players, you should know who they are, how to say their name. Yeah. Dylan Cozens. So a really cool Dylan Cozens card pulled. Brad Marchand. Oh, yeah. Marchand. Couple, couple great Marchand cards. Jason Zucker. Heard mm. that a couple times. That's uh, Zucker. Okay. Zucker. See, I didn't know. Yes. Yep. I can understand butchering some like, you know, Swedish names with a bunch of umlauts above letters and, you know, Russian names that you're not real sure. I get it. I mean, I've butchered a a two, two or three just in this podcast, but my intentions are good. (laughs) Right, right. Let's touch on signature legends real quick before we get into Tops Hockey Stickers. Now, to me, this is the most anticipated set because I've been wanting this set. I've been wanting to see this product. I've been wanting this product to come to fruition since I initially saw the first sell sheet for it. 
2021 SP Signature Legends. It's finally hitting in the next couple of weeks. I believe March 8th is the date. The checklist is out, so we know it's going to exist. So I feel like I've willed this into existence. But for those that don't know, it's a retired player set. So the entire checklist is made up of retired players, legends, and Hall of Famers. And it is a vast, vast, I repeat, vast set by comparison. Not OPG vast, but vast nonetheless. 400? How many? 451 cards in the base set. Now, that includes the short prints. Okay. So that's a lot for a product that, I mean, first of all, that's a lot for any SP product um, because you're not getting SP products with more than 100, 200 cards in them most of the time. So the fact that there's this many cards in a checklist, you think, wow, that's a lot of players. I wonder how deep and how far back they're going to go into some of these teams' rosters. Well, the answer is pretty deep because – there's a lot of players on this checklist that you would not normally find on a card release, at least in this century, meaning the 2000s. You know, with the exception of some of the early retired player sets, like, you know, the Fleer Tradition type sets or the Legacy sets, or mm-hmm. maybe like Parkhurst Champions that came out a little later on, or even the Panini signature set that came out one of those years you don't get a whole lot of this anymore you get a a little mixing sometimes in artifacts or you know in sp where you get some of the retired players generally they're the big names but i mean i always look for the penguins and on the penguin checklist are players like randy carlisle and rick kehoe and john shabbat and the reverend ben lovejoy and oris kintrachuk and yuri slieger I mean, these are names that you don't see ever on modern set checklists. I think it's pretty exciting to see some of these, you know, some of these lists of of players. It's a really cool looking product. If they put older players in a set, it's usually Gretzky, Lemieux, Bah, Gordie Howe, Bobby Orr. Maybe a few other guys, like you might see a Chris Chelios in a set like Artifacts or SP Authentic or something like that. I know there was a couple of Chelios cards for the past few years in like modern sets, and he's a player I collect. So you see guys like that who are like Hall of Fame Mount Rushmore types, but you don't get your Rick Kehoe or your Eddie Olchek or your other guys who are like fan favorites good NHL players, but not Hall of Famers. So you don't see them included in a lot of these sets. So the only way they're really included is in a set of legends. And it is cool to have legends that aren't necessarily Hall of Famers. They could still be legends. Is Ken Danico a legend? Is he a Hall of Famer? No. But is he a legend in New Jersey? Hell yeah, he is. Oh, yeah. I mean, just as an example, I'm like looking at the Boston checklist right now. And you go down the list of names here and yeah, does it have your Ray Borks? Of course it does. Does it have your Jerry Cheevers? Sure. Does it have your Cam Neely? Absolutely. Phil Esposito? Of course it does. Guess who it also has? Byron Defoe. Okay. Al Gill. Al Gill. T- Terry O'Reilly. You gotta have Terry O'Reilly. Wayne Cashman. Andrew Raycroft. Daniel Paye. I mean, come on. It has Bernie Perrant as a Bruin. These aren't cards that you're going to see anymore. Right. Who would make a set with Bernie Perrant? Lots of people. Who would make a set with Bernie Perrant as a Bruin? Probably no one. He's a flyer. I mean, that's what people remember him as. Right. He's a flyer. Did he play for other teams? Sure. What is he known for? Being a flyer. Chris Tamer's on this checklist. Ex-Penguin. Chris Tamer. Guess what team he has him on? What? The Atlanta Thrashers. Legendary. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're not going to get this kind of stuff. I geek out for these kind of sets because they're really cool. 
and to go back and look at the nostalgia of this kind of stuff i think it's great so i'm excited about this about this set coming out I, i'm kind of as people can hear in the sound of my voice that this is going to be a, a a really fun product i think to rip i think it's going to be a fun product to kind of go through and build the set uh it's a fairly extensive set that i think it'll be fun to try to chase it just to give you the particulars on it a box should yield you two autographs out of every box as well as additional hits um so there potentially could be three autographs in there because there are a lot of other autographs that fall on that other hit category and for the most part they're all on card autographs and i think that's another reason that went into which players to decide to put into the set because obviously if you're going to do autograph cards it's a little more difficult to get players to sign if they've passed away or are unavailable um, but two autographs one rare hit card three base gold foil parallels there's going to be canvas legend cards you get four in a box the dominant digit cards which you know show the player numbers there's three of those in every box plus you get additional inserts that have like the behind the boards cards which are ex players that are now coaches which i think is kind of cool kind of plays into your posting the coaches cards every year with the article that you always do um, they have the evolve sets which show like rookie mid-career late career photos on the same card or like you know after they retired you know if players are doing stuff and of course they're playing into the sp bounty program with this too so there are there are bounty cards uh, as well with the scratch offs and you redeem them online to to get like special parallel sets and, and that kind of stuff but uh and they brought back the century legend signatures which are cool you know the dual century legends which have the top and bottom and they brought back the 97 legend signatures design which is like a fan favorite for most hockey collectors people remember that set the autographs that are that are in that set so I'm excited. I, I really am. I mean, two autographs in a box. Price point right now is about 200 bucks. It's a little steep, but I think with what you're able to pull and the value you could potentially pull out of here, I think it'll be pretty good. Five cards a pack, 18 packs in a box. So this isn't like a super premium, you know, you get five cards and you're going to get skunked on all five kind of thing. This is of substance. That's an interesting set. I might look into buying some. I mean, I don't want to spend 200 on a box. And I also feel that like the base sets probably end up on eBay relatively cheap, not counting the short prints, but you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And 200 bucks is a nice price point if you get, you know, especially if you can get good, you know, autographs of some good players. You know, I know there's a lot of hometown heroes and, and fan favorite types, but it sounds like it's worth looking oh, into. Ab absolutely. I mean, you were just at the, the Hurricanes game. Kent Manderville is in the <laughs> set for the Hurricanes. You, you'll probably be able to find people that busted cases and are building sets and trying to sell the base set. 300 cards in the, the base base set. Plus there's another 50 short prints that are base, a bit more base short print, which come like one every three packs. And the rest of the cards that are part of the sequential numbering up to 451 are future watch cards everybody loves the sp future watch you know that's a that's another big rookie but there aren't those for any of these guys doug wilson never had an sp future watch card curtis joseph never had an sp future watch card ted Lindsay never had an sp future watch card so they made well, future watch cards for all of these guys, and they're all numbered either out of 99, 49, or 199. I hope they use rookie year photos, you know. I believe not. they did. Okay, that's an interesting aspect. But we should move on. I want to mention something really quick about National Hockey Card Day. Last podcast, we talked about how the National Hockey Card Day set is going to be the same in the United States and in Canada. I have a little more information now. So the set is going to be 31 cards plus a checklist, not 15 cards.
plus the one bonus card, plus the checklist, it's going to be 30 regular cards, one special card, a rookie moments card of Maddie Beneers, and then the checklist. So 32 cards if you count the checklist. So basically, the set has doubled in size. What Upper Deck decided to do, instead of printing two separate sets, sending one to the U.S., sending the other one to Canada, they're just making one set that's twice as big and then sending it to the U.S. and to Canada. So we pretty much knew that the special card was probably going to be someone like Beneers, but 31 cards plus checklist, which checklist you get one per pack. So <laughs> those of us that have the benefit of having local card shops that we're familiar with that we walk in and they just hand us piles of these packs, we'll have a much easier time putting this set together than those that might only get one or two. That's yeah. for sure. I haven't seen a full checklist yet, but the cards that I do know that are in the set are Alex Ovechkin, Connor McDavid, Kale McCarr, Owen Power, Nick Suzuki, and then the Rookie Moments card of Maddie Beneers. So, oh, and then you know how the big box stores in Canada, they do the uh, nine card uncut sheets. There's going to be a big box retailer in the United States who's also going to be giving away a nine card uncut sheet. I don't know who it is yet. Uh, this information is still coming out, but um, if you go to upperdeck.com slash NHCD, you can find the latest information there about National Hockey Card Day. Definitely won't be Toys R Us, I'll tell you that. 22-23 <laughs> Tops Hockey Sticker Album Collection. So I got some boxes for my birthday end of January opened them in February, sorted them. Took me a long time to, not so much long to open or to sort, but honestly, sticking them in the book takes a long time. <laughs> it's a chore. I think I did that while watching a game. I did about half of them. And then the next night while watching a game, I did the other half of them. But I was happy with the collation of three boxes. But let me just give the rundown about this set. So, there are 679 total stickers in the 22-23 Topps Hockey Sticker Album set. 539 of these stickers are regular, just regular old papery stickers. 140 of the stickers are foil stickers, so the shiny foil stickers. So about a ratio of 4 to 1, which is what you get in a pack. You get four paper stickers, you get one foil sticker. So it's not like it's way disproportionate, like sometimes it is one way or the other where you never seem to have enough foil stickers and you have like tons of extras of the paper stickers. What's interesting about the set this year. Okay. I say interesting. I should say what's interesting to me because most normal collectors wouldn't care, but I'm not most normal collectors. The first thing I noticed was that the tops hockey stickers came in traditional sticker wrappers that looked like panini sticker wrappers, which were like, two pieces of paper glued together. What they did for the first three years is they were like little baseball card packs or like little, like if you think of like Topps baseball, how they're like crimped on the top and the bottom. Yep. Sort of like that. And the other thing is that this year's stickers, the backings are paper. Whereas the first couple of years, the backings were that hard cardboard, almost like they were trying to be mini cards. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I thought that was just kind of a like they're cutting costs, but. I wonder why they're doing it this way now. Anyways, so a pack will run you about a buck a pack. They're cheaper by the box, obviously. You get five stickers in a pack, four are paper stickers. One is the foil sticker. 50 packs in a box. I think the boxes I got were about 38 bucks each or so. Now, the first 544 stickers are just the teams. So every team gets 17 stickers. So it's pretty comprehensive. You get 17 stickers per team. You get a foil sticker of the logo, two foil stickers of star players, one foil sticker of the team mascot, except for Detroit or the Rangers. But it's usually like two star players and a mascot or three star players, a foil logo. And so that's the foil stickers for each team. And each team gets a two page spread. Then there's 12 of the top players and one season highlight sticker. So there's 13 papery stickers. Now, the foil stickers, they're the same as the regular stickers, like same players. So like Edmonton, the two foil stickers are Connor McDavid and 
Leon Dreisaitl, no surprise there. But then they also have just regular stickers in that set. And then the rest of the sticker album, so then stickers 545 through 679, are what we would call subsets. They're not team-oriented per se, but they're kind of like these little side projects. So we have 32 stickers of team captains, six foil stickers called Ice Vibrations, which is just basically six of the most popular players in the league, including Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin. Then there's nine All-Star stickers from the uh, 2022 NHL All-Star game. Then this is weird because then there's another 14 All-Star stickers, but you'll like these because these are designed to look like 85, 86 tops or maybe the 85, 86 tops All-Star stickers because they look like they're taken from Mario Lemieux's rookie year where they have that kind of like indentation at the top where they put a logo. And then after that, there's 18 NHL rookie stickers, which look like 71, 72 tops with the bubble letters and the oval with the bright colors in the background. 20 international ice stickers, although a lot of these players are not what we would call international players or North American players. So it's just another 20 Stickers of star players, but they call it international ice. I mean, that's international if you live in Europe. Then there's 12 stickers of outdoor games. Then they did 10 stickers of something called Selly Season, which is stickers of the players celebrating, like celebrating a goal. Then they have another 10 stickers called Art of the Deke, which is just the player, I guess they're deking, but you can't really tell because... There's not a defenseman falling down at their feet. <laughs> and then it's, it's kind of hard to pull off something that requires motion. Yeah. On a flat 2D surface. Yeah. Well, they kind bring, of bring, like bring back the, uh, the magic motion cards. And then the last six stickers are foil stickers of the Stanley Cup that make a Stanley Cup puzzle. And then the album also has an extra two pages. So instead of putting anything useful on those two pages, it just says, make your own NHL all-star team. And then you get to pick whatever 12 stickers you want to put there. So I know I gave the kind of play-by-play of like what's on this page and what's on that page, but it kind of just gives you an idea of like the breadth of the set. There's a lot of players for every team. And then, you know what, if you like Connor McDavid, you're in luck because there's a lot of Connor McDavid stickers if you like Owen Power and Maddie Beneers, and they have, I guess you could call them rookie stickers or rookie year stickers because these stickers are coming out during their rookie year because they played briefly the previous season. So they were eligible to be included in the sticker set this year. And, you know, that's actually something that Tops did very well. They had an awareness of what popular rookies can we put in. So, of course, They put in guys who are rookies during the 21-22 season, like Spencer Knight and Jeremy Swayman and Trevor Zegras and Quinton Byfield. And you know what? None of those guys would be considered rookies, like or these wouldn't be considered rookie stickers because technically these are a year after their rookie year. But then there's a few guys in here, well, mainly just Beneers and Power. But still, it's nice that they did that. They were smart about that. And they put them in there. So uh, a few times in a few of the different subsets. Let me let me ask an off the wall unrelated question. Please. Does it say anywhere on the album, the stickers themselves, or the sticker packs that this is a fanatics product? Looking at the sticker pack right now, I do not see a fanatics logo. Or anything. I just see tops, NHL, NHL, PA, NHL.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. That's all I see. So I don't see anything that has to do with Fanatics whatsoever. I just wondered if there would be Fanatics bleed over on the tops product for hockey. Just curious if they just happen to put their name on anything just to see it pop up. Now, a couple of interesting little errata about this set. Errors and other variations er- and stuff erotica. like that. Erotica? What? Nope. That's a different podcast. Oh. Damn. Errata. E R R A T A. You've heard that word, right? Yes. I know what you're saying. Okay. So 
the album comes with 10 stickers. They're inserted in the album. They're not stuck in the album. They're like they're on their own backer. They're like stapled in basically. Yeah. Four of the 10 stickers use different photos than the stickers that you find in packs. Just thought that was kind of interesting. So there's 10 stickers, but the stickers of Kirill Kaprizov, Jack Hughes, Thatcher Demko, and David Pasternak use different photos on the stickers that come in the album versus the stickers that you get in the packs. Another thing that's interesting is that there's actually a variation on just one sticker, sticker number 592, Claude Giroux's All-Star sticker. There's one version of the sticker where he's in the Flyers uniform and another version of the sticker where he's in the All-Star uniform, which is weird because it bucks the trend. The nine All-Star cards on one page that are themed to look like the Vegas All-Star game, some of those have the players in All-Star uniforms. But then the next two pages, which use the uh, 85-86 design, Those show the players in their NHL team uniforms, except for the Claude Giroux sticker, which there's two versions, one where he's in a NHL all-star uniform, the other one where he's in a Flyers uniform, which is odd because... It's really odd. It's just so... Because he wasn't even on the Flyers. Well, he ended with the... He ended with the Panthers. Yeah, and now he's on Ottawa. Right. So you're going back quite a distance. Well, in 2122, he was with the Flyers. Didn't this come out after the fact and it has new players on new teams as of the start of the season? No, not necessarily. It just no? Well, no. I thought it did. If it does, I'm not really aware of it. I know sometimes they would put the player on the page of his new team, but he'd still be in an old uniform. Okay. I know like once in a while like Panini would do stuff kind of like out of the norm. Like when Steven Stamkos was a rookie, they had a sticker of Stamkos in a practice jersey to make sure they put him in that set. So they didn't have a game action photo, but they had like a training camp practice photo and they used that. Likewise with Marion Hossa, when he went to the Blackhawks, Panini had a sticker of Hossa in a Blackhawks jersey during training camp. So there are examples in the past where they said, we really got to get this player in a new uniform. Or another one was last year, Seth Jones tops photoshopped Jones into a Blackhawks uniform. It looks like a head swap, but it was a really Mm. odd looking sticker. Um, Since when has tops ever airbrushed anybody? Well, you haven't really seen that in the past 30 years because that really (laughs) fell out of favor. But yeah, they did it a thousand times every year for 30 years and then just stopped for the next 30 years. Right. You know, another thing too, another little bit of error trivia here. Sticker 173 is a foil sticker of Dylan Larkin. And when you go to the spot to put it in, because I had to do a double take. Now, all the mascots, there's a spot for the mascot. And then underneath the box, there's like a little box that juts out that has the mascot's name. And then it says mascot, right? So like I'm looking at like the wild and it has Nordy, mascot, or Bailey, mascot for the Kings, right? So for the Detroit one, it has that little thing that says Al the Octopus, mascot. But then on the box where you affix the sticker, it says 173 Dylan Larkin. And so I did a double take because as I was putting the sticker in the spot, I stopped and I said, wait, Al the Octopus? Maybe this is sticker 174. Then I looked at the backing and it looked was 173. And then I looked and I said, oh, yeah, that's where that's supposed to go. So I think what happened was, was they were originally going to make a sticker of Al and then they didn't. And then they just didn't update the book or they did, but they forgot to move the box for Al the Octopus because it's ambiguous because it lists both Dylan Larkin and Al the Octopus there. And I just thought that was funny. Or or. Maybe Al the Octopus is Dylan Larkin. Yeah, we've never seen him in the same room. Correct. Yeah, that's very true. You Um, heard it here first, if that turns out to be true. Yeah. So here's what I like about the set. I like the big checklist. I like the fact that there's 12 different players per team. I mean, yeah, of course, the big guns, they have extra stickers. They get the foil sticker treatment. They get the all-star sticker treatment, et cetera, et cetera. 
I like the mascot stickers. I like foil logos. I like the fact that the mascots are foil. It just makes their stickers feel a little more special. I like it when they have uniform stickers and they don't have stickers of the team uniforms this year. But they do have multiple cards of the top players and the top rookies. So like I said, if you like Owen Power, guess what? He's in here a couple of times. You like Maddie Paneers? He's in here a couple times as well. What I don't like, two things I don't like about this set. One is that I feel like there's too many subsets. Do we really need Sully Season and Art of the Deke? At that point, it just seemed kind of silly, right? And like Ice Vibrations. I mean, they look kind of cool. They're horizontal foil stickers, but it doesn't add anything. All-Star Game, yes. First and second team All-Star. Not that they made those, but if they did, cool. Stanley Cup, other trophies, those are great. Award winners, they didn't do that this year, but those are great too. But yeah, I thought those were kind of silly, Art of the Deke and Sully Season. And the other problem is that you can't buy the stickers directly from Tops if you need just a few to finish your set. So you either got to trade or keep buying packs. And I see a lot of people trading. I see people making ridiculous offers on Facebook groups because they just need three stickers and they'll just, oh, I'll just pay two bucks each and be done with it or whatever. I mean, I get it. We've all been there. And if you're going to just continue to buy packs until you inevitably get them all. You're in three boxes. How many dupes? The second box, I had 63 paper sticker duplicates and two foil sticker duplicates. And after the third box, I got two of the same foil sticker, which was annoying. And then I got like another 25 doubles. And then I got another 138 paper sticker doubles. So I think after three boxes, I had 519 out of the 679 stickers. So I am short 160 stickers. So that's not bad. 76% of the set after three boxes, you know, and then figure five, 519, 619, 17. So I got about uh, 730 doubles. One box is actually short one sticker, which was annoying. I counted them three times and I was shorted one sticker. It's probably Al the Octopus. Could be. But <laughs> but overall, I thought the collation was a lot better this year. I didn't keep stats on my collation last year because I think I didn't get around to buying and opening my top hockey sticker boxes until the summer. And it's just like, eh, I don't care. Nobody cares. It's summer, right? But during the middle of the season, or like they, these came out in December. So like as soon as these come out, the people who buy them care. But, you know, after the set's like six months old, eight months old, it just I didn't want to post box breaks. Eight months old, that's vintage. Practically. The only thing I would I would maybe like is if they put a few more stickers per team. Because we know every team has more than 12 players. Sure. And they're just featuring the top 12, and that's okay. Every team has a two-page spread, which is like a color action shot. Like, the left page is a color action shot, and then it just kind of bleeds over into this pattern on the right page. And, you know, you don't really cover up too much of the important action. So, you know, like I'm looking like Kirill Kaprizov. But it's like, well, there's two Kirill Kaprizov stickers. Do I also need like a giant picture of him on the sticker album? Or would it be more fun to just have that kind of be like background image? And then I could throw a few more stickers there. And then you could have a few more players. And I, I think that'd be more fun, honestly. I mean... I'm going to guess if they're only going to include 12. And does that 12 count the team logo? Mm -mm, Because there's 17. 12 paper stickers of players, one paper sticker of a season highlight, and then four foil stickers. Two of the top two players, one of the logo, one of the mascot. Or sometimes it's three of the players if they don't have a mascot sticker. So essentially 12 base, like we're going to call them that, base stickers. Yes, yes. Base is a good word for it. So you figure you look at a team, you take the top line, you take the the second line, take the top two D pairings, and the main goaltender. And then you're left with one player. Right. So it would be like the next best player on one of the bottom two lines, the bottom two D pairings, or the backup goaltender. Yep, like looking at the Wild, they have both Mark andre Fleury and Cam Talbot. It's funny because he's not on the team. but Which, yeah, he's not on the team anymore, right? Exactly. And, I mean, I'm looking at, uh, at the Canadiens. They have Carey Price. 
They have Jake Allen and they have Caden Primo. So they have three goaltenders featured. There's also a foil sticker of Carey Price. Interesting. Yeah, I know, right? So they got four goalie stickers, two of Carey Price. What's the last game Carey Price played? I don't know, but you know what? I wouldn't know either from looking at the sticker book because it doesn't have any statistics. just has their date of birth, if they shoot left or right, their height, and their weight. So I was going to say, he only played five games last year. Mm. But he's Carey Price, so they're going to put him in. And they might have thought that he was going to come back this year, so they wanted to include him. Yeah, interesting. No Shea Weber, though. Oh, no, he's not on the Coyotes? Nope. (laughs) Hilarious. And, yeah, you know, I mean, of course, there's Kraken because they've been around for a season now. So it's kind of cool to see Seattle Kraken stickers because last year what Topps did was even though players were drafted to play for the Kraken and they could have, like, just put the players in their old uniforms or used headshots of the players or something to downplay the other team's logo they just had like a giant kraken logo that was made up of a bunch of stickers and that was it so this year they have kraken stickers i'm like oh that's kind of cool i'm surprised they didn't do like an inaugural thing like like a layout on a page or like make a puzzle to do like uh, like the first team celebration at center ice or something no i mean like i said last year the team logo was a puzzle so that's what they did about the Kraken. But yeah, you know, one thing I also kind of miss was like, even though they have like highlights, they're not necessarily interesting stickers. You know, here's this player celebrating this landmark or milestone or whatever. But I miss the way like old Panini sticker books would sometimes have like action stickers. And sometimes they'd be made up of two or four stickers that like, you know, you put together to make like an action scene. Mm -hmm. But that's just me showing my old biases. Like this was so cool. Trading cards and stickers are just, they're different now than what they were 30 years ago. And the fact that 30 years ago, if we wanted to see pictures of our favorite players, trading cards were a way to do that, a reliable way to do that. Assuming that your favorite players got cards. But now it's like you just go on the internet and look them up. You know what I mean? Like, right. so if you want to look for action photos, you could just go online and look for, you know, hockey action photos or, you know, there's so many digital photos from games. I mean, you'll have teams like upload galleries and stuff like that. So I guess the novelty of like, here's this cool photo has kind of definitely faded over time with the Internet. Yeah, I mean, you have easy access to all of that stuff now, so. Yeah. And to your point about having like the puzzle piece cards that make a bigger photo kind of thing. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt when you're trying to put together team sets and you have all these tops and panini stickers sets, Mm -hmm. especially the tops ones where you'd have some type of puzzle piece sticker on the front. And then on the back of the card, the back card backer also had something on it. Mm -hmm. But certain versions had one thing on the back. Other versions had a different thing on the back. Or when they would do the split cards where they had the littler stickers side by side. And some of them had one player on the left and another player on the right and a different combination. Or you would find that player from the left on the one card on a different card on the right with a different Mm -hmm. guy on it. And yeah, there's like a million different combinations of that stuff. So I definitely don't miss that because that is a pain in the butt to collect. Coming from a team collector. Yeah. Yeah. Do you even bother with stickers? I guess you do, because you I know do. all the ins and outs of it. I do. I have an album, a Penguins album, of just the stickers. Panini, Tops, OPG, otherwise. I don't actively go after them, but if I find them, I'll get them, and I need them. I have a checklist. Yeah. Just like everything else. I have lots and lots of checklists. I think I've said everything I'm going to say about the sticker set, other than if you're also collecting it and you want to trade, you know how to find me. Oh, and another thing is that I'll be selling at the Chicago Sports Spectacular in Rosemont on March 17th, 18th, and 19th. So if you're in Chicago or you're in the area or you're going to the Chicago Sports Spectacular, drop by my booth and say hi. 
definitely should do that. Yeah, it's a good show. It's a big show. I think it's going to be bigger with more tables this time because they're moving into the downstairs space. What we really should do, you should go to the show, you should go find Sal's table, you should take a picture of him or a picture of you together, then post it and tag me in it, and then I could see how many people went and saw you and followed the instructions. (laughs) That would be a fun thing. Like, where's Waldo, but where's Sal? And then you have to show proof that you found them. Yeah, just random people walking up, taking my picture. I guess yeah. you said take your picture with me, like yeah. I'm the Easter Bunny or something. Like to either take a picture of you or take a picture with you. Post it and say, look, I found Sal. Here's proof. Yeah, like it wears Waldo. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so I think we should wrap this one up. Yeah, I mean, I got nothing else to say unless you want me to ramble off some more dad jokes. No, no, none of that. Okay, so thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to like and subscribe. Please be sure to tell your friends. Give us a follow on social media. I'm at Puck Junk. Tim is at The Real DFG. If you want to support this podcast, you can do so by buying a shirt at shop.puckjunk.com. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.